May God be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, our God. God. Jesus stopped at Sychar, a town in Samaria, near the tract of, la of land Jacob had been given to his son, Joseph, and Joseph's well was there. Sorry, Jacob's well was there. Weary from the journey, Jesus came and sat by the well. It was around noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The disciples had gone off to the town to buy provisions. The Samaritan woman replied, you are a Jew. How can you ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? Since Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if only you recognized God's gift and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink instead and he would have given you living water. If you please, she challenged Jesus, you do not have a bucket and this well is deep. Where do you expect to get this living water? Surely you do not pretend to be greater than our ancestors, Leah and Rachel and Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it with their descendants and flocks. Jesus replied, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty. No, the water I give will become fountains within them, springing up to provide eternal life. The woman said to Jesus, give me this water so that I will not grow thirsty and have to keep coming all the way here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and then come back here. I do not have a husband, replied the woman. You are right. You do not have a husband, Jesus exclaimed. The fact is, you have had five, and the man you are living with now is not your husband. So what you have said is quite true. I can see you are a prophet, answered the woman. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you, your people claim that Jerusalem is the place where God ought to be worshipped. Jesus told her, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship Abba God, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Your people will worship what they do not understand. We worship what we do understand. After all, salvation is from the Jewish people. Yet, sorry, yet the hour is coming and is already here when real worshipers will worship Abba God in spirit and truth. Indeed, it is just such worshipers whom Abba God seeks. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Jesus, I know that the Messiah, the anointed one, is coming and will tell us everything. Jesus replied, I who speak to you am the Messiah. The disciples, returning at this point, were shocked to find Jesus having a private conversation with a woman. But no one dared ask, what do you want of him? Or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water jar and went off into the town. She said to the people, come and see someone who told me everything I have ever done. Could this be the Messiah? At that, everyone set out from town to meet Jesus. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus told them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. At this, the disciples said to one another, do you think someone has brought him something to eat? Jesus explained to them, doing the will of the one who sent me and bringing this work to completion is my food. Do you not have a saying, four months more and it will be harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe and ready for harvest. Reapers are already collecting their wages. They are gathering fruit for eternal life and sower and reaper will rejoice together. 
So the saying is true, one person sows, another reaps. I have sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the work, and you have come upon the fruits of their labor. Many Samaritans from the town believed in Jesus on the strength of the woman's testimony that he told me everything I ever did. The result was that when, Samaritans, when these Samaritans came to Jesus, they begged him to stay with them a while. So Jesus stayed there two days, and through his own spoken word, many more came to faith. They told the woman, no longer does our faith depend upon your story. We have heard for ourselves, and we know that this really is the savior of the world. The good news of salvation. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Is this the time for the homily? You are welcome to begin the homily, Lee. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, a couple of minutes ago, I, I had my screen. I could see all of you, and it was, it was wonderful to see so many, so many people and people I haven't seen in a while. So hello. Um, if uh, if I, for some reason like it um, becomes sort of choppy, just uh, Jamie, I can see you. Maybe if you just like wave your hand, just let me know um, if it becomes choppy. Okay. This month marks ten years since I first told another human being. I think I might not be straight. It was my high school guidance counselor and I was 16. I have been coming out to people ever since. After learning that I am gay and I go to church, people often ask me, how do you reconcile being gay and Christian? Or isn't there discord between your faith and your sexuality? I imagine some of you may have received questions like these too. My answer was always, no, there is no discord. I believe that God loves me and I have found loving community of dignity that celebrates my being queer. It wasn't until I found myself in spiritual direction a year ago that I realized that maybe this answer is too simple for me. Two relationships led me to look more closely at my faith and how I perceive my sexuality. I recently found out that I have a queer cousin at a family engagement party, I learned that my third cousin, Allison, had moved in with her girlfriend. Now, I have only met Allison once or twice, but I was thrilled to know that I have queer company in my family. A few months later, my mom showed me some photos that Allison had posted on Facebook of her and her girlfriend on vacation celebrating their anniversary. I commented to my mom about how much fun they seemed to be having but inside I was having a conflicting response. Part of me was happy for them, but there was also a little voice inside of me that was saying, why do they have to show off their relationship like that? Couldn't they keep their lives a little more private? To be honest, I have had similar reactions when I have seen a queer couple holding hands while walking down the street. As I reflected on these occurrences, I realized that my judgment of others was a reflection of my own lack of self-acceptance. Around the same time that I found out my cousin Allison was gay, I entered into my first serious relationship. When my ex-girlfriend and I started dating, I discovered that I really enjoyed spending time with her, but it was very difficult for me to show her physical affection. I was afraid that kissing or holding hands with her would not be acceptable in other people's eyes and more importantly, in God's eyes. It took some digging for me to remember that the number one message about sexuality that I received from church as a ch child was, don't have sex until you're married. I learned that sex and other expressions of physical, or other physical expressions of love were only acceptable to God in the context of a heterosexual marriage. And it was this buried belief that was preventing me from entering more fully into the relationship with the woman I was dating. When I shared these experiences with my spiritual director, she suggested that I pray about them and see what God had to say. One of my favorite forms of prayer is Ignatian contemplation or imaginative prayer. You may be familiar with this form of prayer, but in case you are not, I will describe it. 
Ignatian contemplation is based on the belief that God can speak to us through our imagination. I begin by asking God to guide my prayer. Then I select a gospel story and read the passage several times. I pay attention to what images or phrases stand out to me. Once I feel that I have become familiar enough with the passage, I ask God to be with me again, close my eyes, and picture the setting of the passage in my mind's eye. I pay close attention to the details, what I see, hear, taste, smell, and feel. Then I place myself into the scene and let the story come alive as if I was experiencing what was happening. I listen to what God is showing me and try to let God lead me. Sometimes my imagination takes me beyond the text and that is okay. I pay attention to what kind of emotions, memories, desires, and insights arise and what God is trying to tell me with these experiences. When my spiritual director suggested I pray about my experiences with my cousin and my ex-girlfriend, tonight's gospel was the passage that came to mind. The story of Jesus and the Samar sorry, the story of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well was one that I was familiar with but had not read in a long time. I am now going to try to describe to you my experience praying imaginative prayer with this passage. This experience of prayer is very personal and not one that I normally share with anyone, let alone a virtual congregation of people. It will give you insight into my understanding of the divine and my relationship with God. I invite you to receive this openly as my experience and take from it what you will and leave whatever does not resonate with you. As I began my prayer by reading the passage a few times, I was first struck by the beauty of Jesus's description of his living water. The New Revised Standard Version translation says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Isn't that description beautiful? I thought, whatever this living water is, I want it. The other thing that stood out to me as I read the passage was that the Samaritan woman and I have something in common. While she may not be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, or intersex, we both have been outcast because of our sexuality. And interestingly, it is her sexuality that Jesus uses to show her that he knows her. When I began to imagine the scene and placed myself in it, I became the Samaritan woman talking to Jesus. When Jesus asked me for a drink, I thought, how could you, a Jew, ask me, a woman and a lesbian, for a drink? Then I was enthralled as Jesus described his living water to me. I knew that I wanted it, but at the same time, I wasn't quite sure what it was. When Jesus told me, go call your husband and then come back here, I thought, oh no, this is where it is all going to go downhill. No more living water for me. I have no husband because I am a lesbian. But Jesus did not chastise me or, in light of this new information, try to pretend he had not just offered me living water. Instead, he said, you are right, you are a lesbian. I know every thought you have had and everything you have done, and I love you and pray that you might one day love and accept yourself too. Something began to shift within me as I prayed with this passage. My perception of God and what God wants for me started to change, but I was still left with the question, how do I love other people? In the moment when I judged my cousin for her Facebook post 
and the moments when I struggled to show affection to my ex-girlfriend, I felt like I had failed to love. Sometimes this belief that I cannot love well enough keeps me from trying and I become afraid to enter into relationship with others. A few weeks after my imaginative prayer experience with the gospel, I was walking through a park and came to a loud stream. I had been praying as I was walking, but not specifically about this passage. As I listened to the energetic rush of this stream, I realized that this was the power of God's love. Jesus had given me a spring of living water that is gushing up within me to provide eternal life. I have come to believe that it is not because of our own merit that we are able to love, but because God loved us first. It is God's love that gives me the ability to love another. God's love is the source of my love. Now, whenever I worry that I am not capable of loving or I do not have the tools to love another human being, I imagine that spring of water gushing up within me and know that I have access to the source of all love. Our Lenten theme this year is transforming through love, transforming through relationships. During this season, as we reflect on our actions and our relationships with others, I invite you to think about what beliefs influence your actions. Perhaps there is a deep-seated belief that is leading you to behave in a certain way, or maybe there is a small voice inside of you that has been calling out and asking you to listen. This week, while you are sitting self-quarantined at home, you might try imaginative prayer with a passage from one of the Gospels, or you might try sitting quietly and listening to what that little voice inside of you has to say. Or you may try whatever spiritual practice is meaningful for you. This Lent, may we be transformed through God's love and may that love transform our relationships with one another.